Binge the full week of The Ray Taylor Show ad free over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. This is The Ray Taylor Show. Welcome to The Ray Taylor Show, where I bring you reviews on the latest movies and TV shows, as well as classic and foreign films. I'm your host, Ray Taylor, and on this podcast, I'll be talking about all things film and television. Whether you're looking for a new show to binge, or want to know if that blockbuster is worth the trip to the theater, or just want to hear my thoughts on a classic or foreign film, I've got you covered. So join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for new episodes, and let's dive into the world of film and television together. On this episode, I am talking about the Indian film Dil Chadahe from 2001, directed by, written and directed by Farhan Akhtar. Uh, it's also co written by uh, Kasim Jagmajia and stars Amir Khan, uh, Saif Ali Khan, and Akshay Khanna. Uh, it is a three part not really three part but there's three inseparable childhood friends just out of college nothing comes between them until they each fall in love and their wildly different approaches to relationships create tensions i've been watching finally getting back into indian films uh, watching more Amir Khan films in preparation for a top five episode that I release on Sundays where I rank movies in a variety of categories. I will be doing an Amir Khan related top five where I talk about my top five Amir Khan films. So this one is one of the films I'm watching in preparation for that. It's also, I mean, it's one of his more rated, like I'm going through all the better rated uh, Amir Khan films that are available uh, and seeing, you know, seeing what sounds good, you know, because he's been in so many things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've watched a lot. I've watched probably like 10 to 15 movies of his so far. So there's not that many more I need to watch. But this was on my list for a while. I finally got around to watching it. And I did enjoy this movie. Uh, it definitely reminded me in a lot of ways of Three Idiots, which is one of my favorite Amir Khan films, one of, after seeing it, one of my favorite all-time films in general. But not necessarily story-wise in the same, but like the structure of this film is reminded me of Three Idiots. Also, the, the friendship aspect of this film reminded me of Three Idiots. Uh, never necessarily reached the heights of enjoyment that I had while watching Three Idiots, but I did enjoy this movie. In many ways, this is an epic rom-com movie, right? It's just over three hours long, and because it's a movie about three dudes who are friends, the friendship bond between them, it's about their different approaches to relationships, uh, so it has that kind of romantic comedy tinge to it uh i could see couples watching this definitely right i could see this being a good couples movie uh definitely a movie i, I don't know how much uh the female audience would enjoy this movie necessarily but i think they would maybe i don't know uh but that's what i would com would call this movie uh if i were to recommend it i would kind of describe it almost as it's almost like three separate romantic comedies combined into one epic movie in some ways uh you know the title of this movie translates to the heart wants there's a song featured in this movie with uh the title of this movie and that's how i was able to get the translation uh and clearly a, a movie about three people trying to discover what the heart wants and uh you know, it's uh, the uh, this movie, you know, kind of uh, does a wild thing. Right. The reason it's just over three hours, like I said, the three stories, uh, one one st kind of story for each of the male leads. Some stories more involved than others. Obviously, the Amir Khan story is a, a, a big focus of the movie although doesn't seem to be until about halfway through. Um, so we see how all these three dudes enjoy each other as friends, hanging out, 
Um, it sets up their relationships with each other well, understanding their bond they have as, you know, and it reminded me a lot of myself and my friend group in some ways uh, in my 20s. These three guys are a little bit more privileged, I would say. They have families with money, different different levels each friend kind of comes from a, a family of different status but all three of them aren't really let's just say i've never been in a financial position at any point in my life where i could just go on a vacation with my bros uh to like a resort and have fun and do a bunch of things uh that's it's a reality that i've never experienced so seeing that not necessarily an aspect of this movie that I would have uh, that necessarily relate to, but they're just them hanging out and their dynamic reminded me a lot of me and friends in my twenties and hanging out and all that kind of stuff. And it's an interesting time in your life when you're not necessarily, it's like, it's a, a weird in your twenties kind of s more serious relationships, I would say generally. You know, uh, either way, it's uh, that aspect of this movie I enjoyed. And we get to see the differences in these different characters and how they're all very how their approaches to relationships are different. Their sentiment, their their mentalities to relationships is different. Right. There's one character, Samir. He falls in love very easily, very fast. Right. And he will also kind of change who he is to fit with his what his partner wants. Right. Very kind of a codependent type of person in that way. Uh, another character, Sid, is an artist and is far more of the romantic. Right. Looking for deeper connections, maybe looking for a muse on some level. And then we have Akash, who is played by Amir Khan, who is the one avoiding love at all costs and uh, feelings in general at all costs, right? He's got walls up. Uh, he turns serious moments into jokes to avoid emotion. Uh, and he's also, in general, a big jokester, even with his friends. Like, any kind of display of emotion, he resorts to turning it into uh, comedy, into a joke of some ways, of being playful. You know, and uh, and it's a, a common th thing, definitely something that I am known to, maybe not the exact same. I'm kind of, I, if I had to, to, actually, I'm kind of a combination of all three of these guys. <laughs> I can fall in love very easily. Uh, I have been known to change who I am, which that's something I've kind of worked on over the years. Uh, I'm also an artist. I'm also very uh, looking for deeper connections and, uh, you know, a, a romantic kind of have a, a romantic ideal of relationships. Uh, but I'm also somebody because I grew up not really sharing emotions. Right. I'm from the kind of generation where dudes weren't supposed to cry or share emotions there have been many examples in my life where i share my emotions i divulge my mental health issues maybe that i'm going through at a particular moment and then leads to being ghosted uh so i've seen how the negative uh, reaction to a, a dude sharing their emotions uh, can be, but I tend to be this person when confronted with an uncomfortable, dramatic, negative situation will like, turn to comedy, try and make jokes. There's been multiple times uh, where uh, maybe not the most appropriate time to be turning a situation into a joke. So I do relate to all three of these characters, despite the fact that all three of those aspects of myself are represented in three separate characters. So I do appreciate that aspect of it. But wasn't enough. Like, that definitely is something that would make me resonate with this film a lot. But in general, it's weird. Like, despite the fact that I kind of see myself in a lot of ways with these characters, I wasn't as drawn in as I was with th the Three Idiots movie, specifically. That, that movie, I don't necessarily think I relate 
to any of those characters specifically, but the story, like, just such a great movie. And I, I'm sorry I keep comparing this movie to Three Idiots. Aside from Amir Khan being in both movies, aside from Amir Khan kind of playing similar out-of-the-box kind of people in a lot of his films, and the fact that there's both movies involve three a, a friend group of three people, uh, I'll try to avoid my constant comparisons to Three Idiots. But this movie, like... As I was going, I was expecting to love this movie because even there's other uh, another movie, the Basanti movie. I forget how the the title of that, but uh, Rang de Basanti. That's a movie that I was just kind of mediocre on until it flips a switch halfway, two thirds of the way through, and becomes like a, a crazy epic movie. Uh, I was kind of expecting this movie to do that at some level, but it, it never really got to that point. But it was a good movie, a little long, but that is it is what it is. <clears throat> so because each of these characters are different, you get different story, different flavors with each of them as they are dealing with their own different love connections, as it were. And because it's an Indian film, they have no problem. Lo long run times are so common. So just allowing the audience to experience the three stories. Where as most, I would say, if, like if this were made in America, it would have just been the Amir Khan, the Akash character story. And then his friends would have been not even. They would have been so sidelined if this was... It would be like a 90-minute rom-com in, in the U.S., which I wouldn't be surprised if it had been made in the U.S. Um, so I do want to get into spoilers for this movie. I also, in doing preparing for this episode, realized that this was a very low-budget movie, which I did not realize. And I think the comparison financially for the budget, I forget what it is in the actual currency but translated to american dollars this was made for like one million dollars which is absolutely insane uh it's filmed in two locations um so uh, australia and then i think mumbai are th were the two locations it was filmed in and uh kind of crazy watching this though visually like the actual film and editing and the way this film looks definitely some amazing scenes and and uh scenery in this movie but uh there's definitely a lot of moments where the camera feels like it's not steady like not necessarily i'm not saying like it's it's doc style camera movements shaky cam it's more like it's on a tripod but it's like not s steady like there's a jitter uh like a vibration to the camera in some scenes. And I notice that because I'm watching it on my big projector screen. So super noticeable when some scenes are shaky. Uh, and then there's times where it feels like the way the film was developed, like the coloring was off. Um, and some of the edits look, it almost like you could almost see where the film was spliced together. So from a production standpoint, there are moments that make it, make it understandable that this was a very low budget movie very impressive film to be such a low budget film if the the money translations that i had seen in preparation were correct uh very impressive on that level but just not a movie that necessarily resonated with me completely but i do enjoy this movie and i understand why it's so like popular well rated all of those things i get it i get it uh but i do want to talk about spoilers so let's get into that you've been warned if you don't want to be spoiled on this movie that came out 12 years ago um t i'm sorry 22 years ago <sighs> there's moments where i realize just how absurdly old i'm getting which I'm not, I'm 42, I don't feel that old. I mean, I do kind of physically kind of feel that old at times, but uh, let's jump into this movie and stop <laughs> listening to me lament about 
what it feels like to be old. Let's take a quick break from this episode because I want to talk about, are you looking to add some unique and expressive artwork to your home, office, or wardrobe? Look no further than the Many Faces series by Ray Taylor. That's me. These abstract paintings on paper explore the endless possibilities of the human face, capturing unique expressions of emotion, mood, tone, and energy in just a few minimal features. Now you can bring these stunning and thought-provoking pieces into your own space with high-quality prints and t-shirts featuring designs from the Many Faces series, or take home a one-of-a-kind original piece for your collection. Don't miss out on this opportunity to add some original and expressive artwork to your home, office, or wardrobe. Head on over to InspiredDisorder.com to browse and purchase original artworks, prints, and t-shirts from the Many Faces series today. And now, back to the show. Uh, so, spoiler warning... Uh, there's kind of like an event. So similarly to three, uh, the three idiots, another comparison, right? Three idiots starts with like present day seeing some, a couple of the people in a friend group at an event, somebody's missing and you kind of get an idea of these characters, but then the majority of the first part of the movie is kind of a flashback told in a flashback setting up these characters understanding the friendship dynamic between all these characters so very similar in that way where this movie starts with the event of sid's uh partner which we don't know who that is necessarily and they're going to the hospital and um what's his name um let me just open this up so i can get it the other actor instead of Sid is Samir. Samir's at the hospital with Sid and they're talking about, do you think Akash is going to come? Right. And similarly, three idiots, Amir Khan's character is also not present. Right. So comparisons right away, going back to setting everything up is like, okay, this is like structurally so very similar to, uh, I have the names right here on my note. What am I doing? Um, so very structurally similar setting up what led them to the event, right? So seeing how their dynamic is in a friendship, but then also seeing why they don't think Akash will be showing up. What happened to this friend group that split them apart? What is the dynamic of why Akash may not show up, right? So then we get the flashbacks of them hanging out right hanging out at akasha's like kind of bachelor pad which like the tv he had was so similar to the tv i had at that like moved into moved to san just had moved to san diego got a job working at costco making good money right kind of the most the one of the f only times in my life where i was making a lot a really good money but i was just spending it on partying and going to bars and shit I, I remember specifically getting the and it's like a projection TV looks exa exactly like that projection TV that wasn't widescreen like it was a time where projection TVs were turning into widescreen projection TVs and just before like plasmas were coming out flat screens were kind of out but still super expensive and I remember I got one of the last kind of the four by three projection TVs and it was on my calendar TV day. When I was like, I knew I'd saved up enough money. I was going to get this TV. I love movies. And I was so looking forward to getting, like, it had been my dream for years to get a big projection TV. And I rented a U-Haul because it's this giant TV. Those things are super light, by the way, super easy. I lived upstairs, so I had some friends help me carry it up. It was like such a like a momentous occasion in my life to get a TV like that. So seeing this movie and I had like leather couches, I like it, it reminded me Akasha's apartment uh, reminded me a lot of kind of my apartment in some ways. Um, but you see them hanging out, going to clubs, uh, hanging out at Akasha's place, them going on a trip together to Goa, I believe they go on like a trip vacation. So it's kind of like a. A road trip but also mostly them at like this resort playing volleyball on the beach wave runners they go on this pirate ship looking ship sailboat 
They rent motorcycles. They're going fishing, just like an epic boys trip, right? And this is watching this. I was like, like I've never. I mean, I probably at the time where I got the TV, I probably could have afforded to do something like that. But because I grew up poor, I've never really thought to go on a va- like vacations. Were growing up were like me being sent off to go stay with some other family for a month or two. Um, like I never, I've, I've never been able to be comfortable on a vacation. I've never like taken a vacation like that and watching these dudes do that. I was like, man, that's, I would love to live that kind of life for sure. You also have the, there's a woman that like really likes Akash. And I was like expecting this character to play a different role in this movie but she's like a character that really likes Akash and he keeps avoiding her because he's, I mean, in general, he's avoiding love at all costs. So this woman who's like obsessed with him, he's also trying to avoid. She shows up at the hotel. Sid kind of has a conversation with her, kind of trying to understand why she's so desperate to be with Akash. And her thought is like, well, what's wrong with me? Why wouldn't he like, it's like, it's kind of a weird dynamic, this character, but in the moment feels like a character that doesn't need to be there. But again, it's a character where at the end of this movie, she has a purpose and makes sense when she ends up with Sid at the end of this movie makes complete sense. But, you know, this this kind of character Um, And I was thinking, like, maybe she's the reason they split up. Like, maybe she starts dating one of the friends and then Akash realizes that he likes her. I thought she was going to be the thing that splits him up. But, of course, it's not Um, a a beautiful hilltop location that reminded me of a different of Rang De Basanti, which I was talking about Amir Khan in great movie. Uh, There's another it's a different hilltop location. There are multiple hilltop locations in Rang de Basanti that are gorgeous. And there is a similar, but different type of like this great view. This one, it's of the beach and it's on the hill. There's like this old weathered, like wall barrier. That's just kind of crumbling in, in areas. Um, so very aesthetically, so similar to uh, Rang de Basanti, which uh, a great movie. There are multiple, uh, amazing scenes of like these great views of uh, wherever, whatever location that movie takes place. And they all live in nice houses, right? Like just seeing they go on a trip. And then also, I mean, th- some of them live with their parents still. It seems like Akash has the most money. Like his parents have the most money because he has his own bachelor pad. Seems like his parents pay all of his bills. He, he goes to Australia to take over his dad's business uh sid almost seems like kind of the middle income bracket of the three where his parents i mean he's an artist so you know it's it's you have to have somebody in your life that will allow you to exist without paying a lot of money to exist uh hence being able to live at home for sid uh and it's super nice house down the street from this other this woman that he falls in love with but like, you know, clearly there's some money there. And it seemed as though that uh, Samir may be like the lower, which is also similar to the financial differences in Three Idiots. Right. Another comparison. Uh, but yeah, seeing their house is like, OK, they're kind of like privileged. Like, I don't know what the term would be for India, but like upper middle class kind of right. Middle class, upper middle class. Uh, let's see here. Then you have one night while they're all out. There's the scene that kind of introduces us to what becomes the love interest for Akash, where he's out at the, a club with his friends and he wants to go dance with this woman. And because he's a funny guy, he decides, and she's kind of blowing him off. He decides to propose to her, right? Just going, Oh, like d- d- what he does I could almost see myself doing and have done certain things like that. I remember one time drunk with my friends at a Denny's 
and there were these girls at the jukebox trying to choose what songs and i went over and started flirting with these girls or at least one of the girls in general and you know i had the liquid courage i was drunk and i also just don't i don't necessarily even though i'm kind of shy and quiet i don't really i've never really had much of a problem asking women out or talking to women but definitely being intoxicated i was definitely not only more uh brave in that situation but also very unaware as a cautious that maybe there is a a male counterpart that is there with the women and i remember my friends literally picking me up and carrying me out of denny's to get out of there because uh their boyfriend or whoever the dude that was with them looked like they wanted to beat me up and i was like oh i just want to give you a hug that's usually when people want to fight me is usually when i want to like hug them there's been many (laughs) many stories of me drunk and somebody wanting to fight me and then i just like no, it's all love, bro. I'm like usually a very happy drunk type of person. But Akash proposing to this girl, like going overboard, just trying to be funny, and then finding out she's got a, a fiance gives them a black eye, right? Very jokey, using humor in so many situations. Also, like if you're a woman and you notice yourself that I'm making you laugh a lot, uh, I'm hitting on you. <laughs> like that's my move. It's not intentional. It's just what I do. I'm like, usually because I'm nervous or uncomfortable and in situations like that, same reason why if it's a, it's, if it's a serious situation, I will go to comedy. I just unintentional. Like I, it's like, I can't help it. It's like the way, the only way I can assert control over a situation is to be funny. If so, if I'm uncomfortable, whatever, I will try to be funny because it's like, if you can make somebody laugh, then they're not thinking of, you know, whatever my issues were about who I am. So I noticed that as well in Akash, that he likes to be funny. You see Samir pressured to break up with his girlfriend by Akash, which because he was embarrassing after him proposing in the thing. And like, I, one, I've had a girlfriend who felt embarrassed by me rapping at a party once. So I I know... I mean, she wasn't embarrassed in this movie. She wasn't embarrassed by Samir, but embarrassed by Akash in hanging out with them. But Samir is the guy who changes who he is to mold to this girlfriend. And Akash basically sets Samir up to make it seem like he's cheating on this girlfriend in order for her to break him up. And when that happened, I thought Akash, like his character was going to be like he's an asshole. He's a douchebag. Right. He just like he's manipulating a situation to get what he wants. He doesn't care if his friend gets dumped or not. But then you realize that it was because Samir became a different person going out with this woman. And he actually thanks him later on because it kind of freed him from being this person that she turned him into, which he didn't like. His friends didn't like. So that was kind of an interesting situation dynamic with akash and and samir and even when they go to goa samir falls in love with everybody so fast he meets this danish i think she was from denmark or something like that falls in love convinces him to stay but of course then he gets robbed and then later you know like all these this dude goes through multiple relationships in this that's how samir runs right And then at the end, like his parents want to set him up, right? uh, Get an arranged marriage with this woman. He doesn't want an arranged marriage. She doesn't want an arranged marriage. But of course, as soon as he meets her, he falls in love with her and then decides to try and break her relationship up that she already has. And that's why she doesn't want to be in. So it's like his situation, Samir's, uh, relationships is kind of funny kind of sad as well but you know they all end up being happy endings for all of them uh sid the artist he's got like a solo exhibition or maybe it's a group show but like like he's in a place not only is he still living at home he's painting doing these massive paintings he's doing legitimate art gallery shows so it's not like he's even like new to doing shows like he's he may not be 
successful, but at least he's far from just getting his foot in the door. And I'm very critical about how artists are depicted in movies because it's very much usually depicted in a very romantic, idealized, kind of not very authentically real to what it's like. Um, and this movie is kind of like that in a way. Uh, but also knowing that, you know, maybe his family has connections. He's obviously being has the freedom to paint and being financially covered by his parents. It's like, like I can see how that romantic ideal of being an artist can become real in his situation. Uh, he has a dream. Like he meets this, this uh, older woman that lives down the street from him. And he kind of falls for her over the course, not necessarily right away. Um, but, you know, she she has a kid. She comes from like a broken marriage that her husband has money and paid lawyers. So she doesn't even have access to her kid. But like there's something about her, her, her like brokenness that Sid is attracted to. He's a dreamer. He has a dream. It's very much like uh, What Dreams May Come, the Robin Williams film that's very depressing where he, like, exists inside paintings. Uh, there's a kind of a musical segment with Sid uh, dreaming of this woman. And it turns out that she is the one who went to the hospital. She's an alcoholic and had the kidney issues, which when kind of when a kosh kind of when Sid tells Akash that he loves her, tells both of his friends, and Akash, as he does, tries to talk all of his friends out of their relationships because he wants them to be friends. He doesn't want them to have relationships. He's not in a relationship. And he gets slapped by Sid because, you know, Akash was, you know, talking about her age and she's got a kid and, like, all these things, kind of just bad-mouthing her and Sid. That's the event that sp split them up in a lot of ways. So that kind of made sense why that's set up. And then Akash later goes to Australia to run his dad's business. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's why. But then there's a moment where it's confusing why. Like they all kind of like there's clear that Akash is like wishing to be back with his friends, you know, after his whole thing, which, you know, so after that event, after the event he goes to Australia, right, to run his dad's business in Australia. And um, Sid goes to do, like, everybody kind of does their own thing. Sid gets, like, an internship or something like that, and some art thing. They all kind of go separate ways. Let's take a quick break right now to talk about, are you a fan of original artwork and live events? Look no further than the Many Faces series by Ray Taylor and the weekly live stream over at youtube.com slash inspired disorder. This ongoing series explores the endless possibilities of the human face through abstract ink paintings on paper, capturing unique expressions of emotion, mood, tone, and energy in just a few minimal features. Join me every Thursday at 420 Pacific Time as I paint live. Follow the Many Faces series and discover the endless possibilities of the human face. Don't miss out on this opportunity to be part of the action and own a piece of original artwork by me, Ray Taylor. Head to youtube.com slash inspired disorder every Thursday to catch the live stream and visit inspireddisorder.com to browse and purchase the many faces artwork. And now let's get back to the show. Um, and of course, like the one thing that like <clears throat> I had the biggest problem with is when Akash is on the plane to go to Australia. And of course, the only person that would be the most convenient person to be sitting next to him on a flight to Australia. The exact right next seat right next to him, of course, is the woman that he proposed to because he wanted to dance with at the club. Right. It's like. Uh, Cellini, like the it is it, by far the most the biggest stretch of 
of believability that of course she's sitting right next to him but whatever get over that the rest of it's good and then from that point you spend a lot of time with them and you see how he's like there's clearly a bond between them but you see how in every opportunity he turns things into a joke and she's still engaged he's non-committal like there's no reason why they would get together But there is a moment where they're separated as subway that really shows like they look at each other like he gets into the subway or train before she's able to. And there's a look they give each other staring at each other through the window as the train's pulling away where it's like this sincere look of loss. And then her worry when she's thinking people are going to do something to her and then he shows up. And of course, in his best way. Like there's this homeless guy that's coming up to her that's scaring her and Akashis gives the homeless guy a big hug. And he's like, oh, is she scaring you, buddy? Is she going to scare you? Is she scaring you? Amazing. So great. So great. Uh, the There is a big thing because she is uh, engaged to be married to this douchebag guy, right? And Rohit. And... Seeing what kind of a douchebag he is, super controlling, not allowing. The only reason she's even hanging out with Akash is because she's in Australia, right? And he's back in India. But he still, you know, wants her to cause, like, super controlling of every aspect of her life, which is, it's insane how many, like, I, I have a lot of female friends. I probably have more women friends than I do male friends. And it's so sad how many women will be in relationships with guys that are like this and they will be like not necessarily even specifically like this controlling but just assholes in one way or another and how they will just constantly convince themselves that's like this person's getting better this person's gonna change for them so many times they think getting a kid is going to fix the situation. And, of course, the dudes never change. The dudes never change. And eventually they end up getting a divorce. They end up having multiple kids. And the, the dude's the same asshole he was in his 20s. It's just so painful to see so many women do that. Similar thing with, like, women marrying conservative dudes. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's hard to it's like it's it's watching somebody slam themselves into a brick wall. It's like there's nothing you can do to stop it. They're not going to listen to any like words of advice, especially for me. But anyway, I had that same feeling with her and this guy who is a jerk. He is not a good guy. And that's kind of one of the things that makes Akasha's story so painful to see, right? He's somebody that's so guarded of his heart and his feelings. And her situation is so messed up. And despite her maybe being open to being with him, his guarded nature won't admit to her. So she's kind of staying in this situation because it's like because just being on your own isn't an option, which is also insane. Like this idea, so many women is like I've have, they're like they they can't exist outside of a relationship. And then you find out even more of the relationship where that's even crazier that like. She was actually raised by Rohit's parents and to pay them back. That is why she is marrying their son. It is like she's a stepson, a stepchild of this family. And they're, she's going to marry her stepbrother, even though they're not related at all. But still, she's like an adopted sibling. Like that's I don't know how often that that happens, but that's like that's crazy to me and obviously culturally india organized marriages all of those things there's other things that it's hard for me to wrap my head around but her specific situation in this 
is painful. And even when he goes to the wedding to finally tell her, and sh- you know, the, he goes. They she talks to Rohit's parents. And even when the dad comes out, like there is a twist where he's like, I want you to marry Akash. I was like, whoa, I was not expecting that at all. It's it's kind of a it's a crazy scene because it's a scene you'll never like you're never going to see that in an American movie. It would it wouldn't make sense in an American movie. Or it would be totally way different if that were to happen in an American movie. So. Very interesting. Also, the wardrobes, the which early 2000s, I mean, people were wearing crazy stuff. But it's weird how many people, how many times I noticed characters in this wearing, like, mesh shirts that you can kind of see through. And you can only really tell because you, like, see the belt buckle shining through. Um, very crazy. And, like, I know similar douchebags. It's like a douchebag style, which is kind of sad. Ed Hardy affliction, kind of that metrosexual kind of trend that was popular in the early 2000s. Um, And that mesh shirt, like club wear, like uh, like it's it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. And like when. He like. So before he goes to propose to her and. Like, Rohit comes back. Like, there's a moment they go to an opera, and it seems like he's finally going to tell her that he loves her or that he likes her, but turns it into a joke talking about the opera. And she decides, Rohit shows up, and she decides it's kind of a a moment for her to choose to either stay with Akash, who hasn't admitted to being in love with her, or to what we find out repay Rohit's family for raising her by marrying their son. It doesn't make any sense why she stayed with him. Like what the hell? But you see Akash like get super depressed and you see how he's like longing for his friends. And it's in this moment where I'm thinking back to how this whole movie started. And it's like, well, why? Like, it's clear that Akash is missing. He's alone now. Because now the only person he was hanging out with was uh, Shalini. And now he's not hanging out with her. She's going back to get married to this douchebag. All of his friends are back home. Doesn't talk to them. He is like alone. He's depressed, which I related to. There's a lot of moments of this movie I related to. So I'm like, why? It doesn't make any sense why he wouldn't show up. It's like he would be so excited to hear from his friends. So I got a little confused in that moment. But then the wedding happens and you realize everything and he goes back to India. Like in that in that moment, his dad realizes he calls his dad dad. Great dad. Identifying that his son is depressed telling him to come back home right really cares about his son's feelings like oh it's great parents which is good but yeah the whole marriage thing was crazy and then there's the reveal that oh he surprises them at the hospital which was a great touching moment uh cleared up my confusion like clearly did that to set up the fact that he would surprise them at the hospital um, and then when it ends, them all going to Goa and Sid is like the fifth wheel in this two couple scenario. Uh, and then he sees that the woman from the beginning that was obsessed with the Kosh. And it's like, oh, there you go. Makes complete sense. Wraps up completely good. Makes her character make any sense. Right. They both kind of share this romantic longing, this ideal type of thing in their head. So love that aspect in the end it all wraps up nicely right happy ending for all three men they're all found love right they took separate paths because they're such different people but found the best fits for each of their their situations right and despite the runtime right being justified in telling all of these separate stories uh it did kind of feel long but i did enjoy it right i really did enjoy the akash story obviously 
Right? You're going to watch an Amir Khan. He's going to have an important role. And it really comes through, especially once he gets to Australia. So I did enjoy this movie. I can understand why. I don't know if it's considered a classic, but I can understand if it was uh, a great movie, especially for being a low-budget movie. Great stuff. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning into this episode of The Ray Taylor Show. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on uh, on this movie, uh, Dil Chada Hey. Dil Chada Hey. Dil Chada Hey. I forget what the song was, but uh, I, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on Chul Dada Hey. Uh, don't forget to tune in every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for new movie and TV show reviews. And join the conversation by leaving a comment or rating on your favorite podcast platform or over on YouTube if you're watching the video version of this at youtube.com slash inspired disorder. Until next time, enjoy the show. New episodes of The Ray Taylor Show come out every single day. Subscribe on YouTube and everywhere our podcasts are found. Binge the full week over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. Buy Ray Taylor Show merch over at inspireddisorder.com. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Peace. Out! Today is the day where you wake up and you realize that everything that you've been dreaming about, everything that you've been wanting, every goal and wish and hope that you've ever had can become real. Dreams can come true. What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality.